Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. As we continue in the Pentecost season, Jesus gives us his wisdom. He is determined to bless us, and bless us he does. In so many ways, as we look at our lives, we are blessed by God. But he doesn't want these blessings to become the object of our heart. He alone is God. He alone captures our heart. He alone gives us things that are eternal. And he gives us his wisdom so we stay focused on eternal things. That'll be an emphasis in the message today. And it begins that emphasis in the opening hymn, hymn 484. May God bless our worship of him. Please stand. Our service this morning continues on page three in your service folder. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan in every evil, Hear our prayer, O Christ. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, uphold us by your power 
and keep us in your tender care. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. Pray, O God, you reveal your mighty power chiefly in showing mercy and kindness. Grant us the full measure of your grace that we may obtain your promises and become partakers of your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. You may be seated. As Pastor Tom Have mentioned, our focus this morning as we look at and hear at God's word, that eternal riches are the real blessings. True wealth is found in the Lord, our Old Testament lesson, Ecclesiastes. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. And who knows whether he will be a wise man or a fool. Yet he will have control over all the work into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. So my heart began to despair over all my toilsome labor under the sun. For a man may do his work with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, and then he must leave all he owns to someone who has not worked for it. This, too, is meaningless and a great misfortune. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days his work is pain and grief, even at night his mind does not rest. This too is meaningless. A man can do nothing better than to eat and drink and find satisfaction in his work. This too, I see, is from the hand of God. For without him, who can eat or find enjoyment? To the man who pleases him, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and happiness. But to the sinner... He gives the task of gathering and storing up wealth to hand it over to the one who pleases God. This too is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. The word of the Lord. Just as life is meaningless without the Savior God, so too our real joy in life is that we, by his grace, are God's chosen people. That's the point of Psalm 34. We sing it together.
Again, lasting joy, comfort in this life is not in the temporal things, but the eternal things that God gives to us through Christ. Our second lesson from James chapter 5. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered innocent men who were not opposing you. Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too, be patient and stand firm, because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. The word of the Lord. In honor of the Savior, please stand for the reading of the Gospel lesson. Today's Gospel lesson, which will also serve as the basis of the message, is taken from Luke chapter 12. Faith focuses on eternal things, eternal possessions. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, What shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, You have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. 
then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich toward God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. You may be seated. We continue with the singing of hymn 421. God's grace, his mercy, his peace are yours to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, who speaks to us and says, watch out, be on guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. I'm going to date myself. This was a bumper sticker I remember in the 80s. I don't know if it was exclusive to the 80s, but it said, the man with the most toys in the end wins. And I, I remember vividly as a kid seeing that and the, the guy driving this monster truck with the lift kit and all that, and I thought, that would be awesome to own that one day, right? He's winning. And the 90s were a perfect time to exercise that, to acquire, and, and the, the 2000s and on to 2019, it, it's just been the way that we as a country function. We're consumers. We, we buy and we have and we need and we grow the things that that we have so that we can have more and it, it gets to be almost this daunting thing and, and we, we have to have the cars and we have to have the houses and we have to have the clothes, we have to have these things and we have to have bigger places to store these things. Nowadays, if you're looking for a home and it doesn't have a third garage stall, you think, well, that's not even worth my consideration. Where am I going to put, you put the list there, right? The snowmobiles, the ATVs, the, the boat, the, and, and even kids, oh my goodness, you're walking into dorm rooms, and now what's coming in is 60-inch flat-screen TVs. It's the first thing they move in. <laughs> Clothes, that's just a, you know, stereos are smaller, but way more expensive and way more powerful. 
We have to have the stuff, the toys. You have to have the latest. And now companies push you to buy the newest and latest things. They won't even give you updates for the things. They're only a couple years old because they want you to have the new, the best, the greatest. And we buy and we consume and we have. And it's not wrong to have and to buy and consume except for if the consuming consumes. You find yourself on this, this wheel, this rat race. You watch a TV show about buying homes, and it's kind of an interesting thing. Which one are they going to choose? And what is the comment often made? When they walk into the closet that's for the master suite, well, that's a good place for my shoes, but where are you going to put all your clothes? And I look at that and I say, that, that closet was bigger than the first bedroom I had in the first apartment that I owned. Do you see where I'm going with this? We laugh, but it also is a commentary. We have to have rummage sales, and we're not moving. Why? Because we've got to get rid of stuff. I know some stuff you grow out of and it gets old, but not always. And, and kids, when they get out of their, to their first job and they got the starter home and they got to buy the one garage stall and whatever, they wonder, where am I going to put the stuff? Because the first thing i got to get is this, and it has to be parked in the street. So where am I going with this? Well, round and round we go, and it's working to buy, and working to buy, and working to buy, working to buy. Jesus sees it. He wants to bless us. He gives us all good things, talents, abilities to do good things, to to work hard, to gain, to grow. But he also sees that sometimes these things start to push important things out of our heart. And that's a problem. Because now we're dealing with eternal things, not just temporal things. And so he sees fit today and asks us to just take a moment and not worry about tomorrow because we're sitting here today in a very good place where we sit down and we open our ears and listen to what Jesus has to say and he wants to give us a warning. And, and maybe before we get to that warning, I'm going to ask you a question. How are you living? Are you living possessed by possessions or are you living like one possessing eternal life? That's, that's what we'll try to distill, and Jesus helps us in these words. He says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. You see, the possessions aren't the problem. It's the abundance of them which leads to greed, and that greed is the, is the real thing. How can I avoid greed? That's hard. Well, I can avoid greed by keeping God first, right? That's what I need to do. If I keep God number one, then greed doesn't have a place in my heart. So we think, okay, so I go to church, and I I read my meditations, and I put the offerings in. I'm keeping God first. I remember to pray before I go to bed. I remember to pray before meals and maybe even after. I take some times. Maybe I'm even diving into a devotional life. God is first. And then I can go after I put God first, I go and do this. I work, and I go do this, and I do family. I go do this, and I work pleasure. And you see, that's not actually keeping God first. That's just making God one priority among a bunch of other priorities we have in life. That's, that's hard. Well, first, we have to go to the first commandment. God says we should fear, love, and trust in him above all things. Otherwise, it's idolatry. God who, who made us, who gives us all that we are, makes us all that we, we, or gives us all we have, makes us all that we are, deserves our number one, our, our heart, our time, our talents, our everything. And that's where God needs to be, the God. In everything. That means that God isn't just ranked among a bunch of other things that are big priorities. It means that God is the number one in life. God is the number one in work. God is the number one in family. God is the number one in play and pleasure. God is the number one over all these things. God is to be God. And if God isn't number one in these things, then that's when greed comes in and takes hold, and our country and our culture caters to that. It wants our heart, and it just always puts in front of us the thing that's going to put a smile on your face. The thing, if you do this, you have this, then you've made it. And it's this, this culture that caters to greed. So are we possessed by our possessions, or do we live like people possessing eternal life? Well, if greed pushes God out, greed is idolatry. Greed is a matter of the heart. And our heart is very good at producing false idols that we follow and chase after. But I'll give you this warning. All the idols that this world gives as as things worth pursuing, as an end and of themselves, they'll work you to death. They can never deliver what they promise. 
It may be short-lived, and it could be a smile that comes, but it never will last. And, and when you commune with these gods, you leave the table feeling empty. And if we want a good example of one who did this, and God records it, although Solomon's probably not proud of it, he gives us some of the wisdom that he learned in his life, and that was the first lesson. You have Solomon who went and said, I am going to pursue everything there is to pursue. Wisdom and commerce and pleasure and wealth, he denied himself nothing. He learned everything that was to be learned, and God gave him the gift of knowledge, and he had it. People would come and just wow at what he had in knowledge. And when it came to things, he used that knowledge to produce an amazing kingdom and and just lavishness. And it came to the pleasures of this life when it came to women and wine and, and feasting. He had it all. It was there right in front of him. All these things, if you tried to amass what he accomplished in life, you couldn't do it. If we combined everything you did in all our lives here together, we couldn't come close to Solomon. And then he gives us this commentary. He says, it's, it's really meaningless. Meaningless. I thought these things would be for me what they never came to be, and now I've wasted how much of my life pursuing these things so that my kids can argue over an inheritance and spend them in ways I would never condone, and they never earned a penny of it. It's meaningless, because when I die, it goes away, and I can't enjoy it anymore. He says, all the things I pursued, the things of my heart, it's simply a graveyard. And this is his words. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving with which he labors under the sun? All his days, his work, his pain and grief, even at night his mind is not at rest. This too is meaningless. Do you want a commentary of that? Antacids, pain relievers, sleep aids, anxiousness, just the whole level of psychology that has to come, not from things that are chemical, but from things that we decide to pursue that give us these false gods that give us these promises that they don't fulfill and it affects us in health. We look at ourselves and say, I'm aging too quickly. Why is that? Is it because our hearts are pursuing things that don't really ever give us life? That's what these things lead to. It's like chasing the wind and they do not deliver. Possessed? Or possessing is is the question that Jesus decides to answer because two guys came to him and said, you know what, we're fighting over our inheritance. Can you solve this? And and this is the irony of this. Can I just spend a moment there? You have two guys that are are over this inheritance. And a lot of times when there was a problem in the family, they would ask a rabbi to use his biblical wisdom to solve this. And so, of course, this guy is the mover and shaker as far as wisdom and let's ask him to solve our dispute over if we go 50 to 50 or if he gets 90%, I get 10%, all that kind of stuff. Jesus solved this because we can't come to terms. So they're worried about maybe getting 50% of the cash or land. And who are they staring at? The one that gives eternal life, that gives them everything. They want to, to have the cash in hand and they do, really don't want what Jesus really came to give, which is eternal life. And Jesus takes this time to tell a parable. And it's a parable that that really can hit home when we look at our lives, too. And if anything I've said preaches a sermon to your heart, listen closely to these words, because that's where Jesus wants to get. He wants to get to your heart. He talks about a, a man who must have been a successful farmer because his barns were already filled and and he went and planted seed that year and it was a harvest that he saw was going to be amazing and he didn't really plan for it along the way all of a sudden when it came to harvest time he kind of panicked and realized what am I gonna do with all this there is way more of the harvest than I can even store for myself he didn't think about being generous he didn't think about or anything else he thought what am I gonna do with my stuff and and so he thought I'd build bigger barns that makes sense right So he invests what he has to build bigger barns to store that up. And that seems like wise, wise, right, as far as business. But you notice during the whole time, he said, my, 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 my. And it appeared as as if this gentleman had his whole life been pushing God out and allowing things to come in. Now he thought, I finally have made it. Now I have enough that I won't have to do anything again. Now I have made it in life and I can relax. 
And Jesus says there's a problem here because in your life you've been pushing me out and leaving no room for me. And he calls him this. He says, you fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And, and these things that you prepared for, whose will they be then? When you die, who, who do they go to? And so he says, tonight you die. And the foolish man who had thought he had everything put together, it's time to enjoy, really had nothing that lasted. Can I ask you a question? Would that man have planned things differently if he knew that night he would have died? Do you think that things would have maybe gone a little differently if, he, if, if they had been told by, by God himself, this night you're going to die? Would his life have looked different if he knew he would be accountable to God? He always thought he had more time. He always thought these things were more important. And then when it came to the end, these things became worthless. And the most important thing was lost. I'll ask you the same question and apply it to you. If tomorrow night God said you're going to die, would the things you do in the next maybe 36 hours be any different than what you did in the last 36 hours? That's... That's telling, isn't it? Would I change the way that I act and what I do because now I know I'm going to have to face God? Why doesn't my whole life look like that? And that's what Jesus is getting at. Greed can sneak in and, and sin has a place in our heart. We're born with it. And if sin has its way, it has and wants nothing to do with God. And God wants everything to do with you. That's why Paul warned his hearers. He said, The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some eagle for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. The apostle says people pursuing these things have actually lost God in the process. God doesn't want it, and the people then find out it's too late. Faith has no place. Maybe their barns were full, but their, their hearts were empty. And then their lives were demanded of them. What then? What then? Boy, I, I've preached a pretty hard and negative sermon. Probably with all this preaching, some of you were already tuned out saying, oh my goodness, is he going to get to the good news? Well, it's right there in front of us. Jesus comes that we might have life, real life, and have it to the full. He shows us the proper place for, for poverty and riches and, and how he actually flips that on his head. He says, I gave up all wealth and power and dominion because I wanted to humble myself and became poor so that through my poverty you might enjoy riches that go beyond this life, riches that last. And so Jesus with the perfect pattern decides to come down and is put in a manger, lives a humble life. He's the one that had to beg meals and be, be a, a recipient of charity from those he witnessed to. He's the one that's put on a cross and thrown away as God punished the world's sin on him, put into a borrowed tomb for a few days. But then he is raised to life so that we might have life. Then he was raised to life and glorified so then his riches could be shared with us. And his riches are so different. His riches are not a false god. His riches deliver exactly what they promise. They give us forgiveness, they give us peace, they give us hope, they give us purpose, they give us meaning, they give us value, they give us beyond this life all that we could dream of. This life isn't even an appetizer to the banquet God has prepared, but it does more than that. It frees us. It frees us from the courting of the world. It frees us from the anxiousness and the anxiety that we have to do and to have so that we can be. God says you already are. I define who you are. You are already kings and queens in my kingdom. I have established that in baptism. I already make you that. I just have to wait till you get there. It's already a reality in my mind's eye. This is what God is determined to do. So are you ones living possessed by possessions? Or do you live every day knowing you possess eternal life? Because life is far different depending on which one you're living. Let me give you a scenario. If you were to lose everything that you have amassed, everything that you have, everything that you are, and it's all the stuff that you've put aside, everything you've strived so hard for, the meaningful things, you lose it all in just one big swoop, you lose your health, you lose everything, and you die. Have you really lost anything if you have Jesus? 
Think about that for a moment. Everything that you have, these are good things, they're blessings, true. But if you lose them all, you really lose nothing that lasts, right? Because you have Jesus. Jesus is the one thing that lasts. Faith in him is the one thing that lasts. So I've done a whole big, long sermon preaching against all these things as if they're evil in and of themselves. They are not. Otherwise, God would not give them. God would make you sit around poking at a fire with sticks, wearing a loincloth, doing nothing and having nothing, and say, you just this life is going to be suffering, and then you go to heaven. That's not the way God chooses to, to bless us. So how do we use these blessings to glorify him? Solomon talks about it. He says, A man can do nothing better than to eat and to drink and find satisfaction in his work. This is, too, from the hand of God. God wants you to find satisfaction in these things, earned and purchased. But he does not want these things to be the center of who you are, to not to be the center of your life. That's for God alone. So how do we find the balance? Well, that's the good work of the Holy Spirit. That's looking at the track record of God who gives us all these things. You can labor and have these things, but we use them to serve God. We use them to serve our neighbor, and there is joy in that. God is good. He trusts us with that goodness. We get to empty ourselves in our lives because God trusts us to do these things. We realize that we don't have to say that our existence and our identity is wrapped up in what we do and what we have. No, no, no. Your identity and your existence has a far different purpose. God has chosen you to be his own. You are a child of God, and he already has the end worked out. You're going to be in heaven with him. That is your identity, and that is your purpose. Everything leads to that end. The Greeks thought they had this salt. They would look at this life as this one big spin on this marble in the sky, and this is what you did. You, you, you eat, and you drink, and you'd be merry because tomorrow you might die, so you've got to enjoy everything in this life because someday you're going to die, and that's the way they lived because they thought they just went out of existence. Well, that's a pretty sad way to live, right? You get 60, 70, 80, 90 years, and then that's it. You better suck the marrow out of life. Those, that, or I should say, that saying is, is by people possessed by possessions. I, I'd like to change it. Because people like you and me who have been buried with Christ in baptism, people in, like you and me who have eternal life, people like you and me who have the most valuable thing that God could give, it's himself and the eternity that is him, we, we live differently. And I'm going to change that saying to, to this. Eat, drink, and rejoice. Because tomorrow you live. You possess eternal life. You will never die in Jesus because Jesus is life and he promises that life to you so live like it amen please stand now may the peace of God which is ours through Jesus Christ who is our most valued possession who gives us eternal life so move our hearts and our minds to know as we live with eternal life we can be a blessing to God and to all around us as we manage our possessions. Amen. I invite you to open your service folders or to follow along on the screen as we confess our faith together in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. 
We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. As we gather our offerings this morning, we ask you also take this time to sign the friendship register, leaving record of your worship with us, and let us know by marking the appropriate box how we can serve you further. prayer. We pray. Lord of our lives, by sending your Son to live and die as our perfect substitute, you provided forgiveness and salvation for a world of sinners. We praise you for your generous saving love. We thank you for reaching out to each of us personally with your word in the water of baptism. You have set us apart as people who belong to you, people whose purpose in life is to receive your love and to live to your glory. Gracious Father, remind us that you have called us to live for you and not for ourselves, or according to the standards of the world. Help us devote our time, our talents, our energy, and whatever you have placed into our hands to those things that will be of value for eternity. Help us to love you and others, and to use things as you desire, instead of loving things and trying to use you and others for our own selfish desires. May our hearts belong to you completely so that our lives can be devoted to things that really matter. Bless all who are suffering or in need. Be with the lonely and the grief-stricken. Move us to use the unique gifts you have given each of us to bring comfort and help to those who need it. Bless the government and the church and make us blessings to both. Hear us now, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Crush the selfishness that comes to us naturally and fill us with joyful generosity. Grant that the gifts we bring to you may show that we are just as diligent and just as interested in carrying out your business as we are in carrying out our own. We dare to ask all this, Father, not because we deserve to ask it, but because your Son has earned for us the right to approach you as your dear children. And we do so in praying the prayer which he himself has taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Praise to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love, He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children and to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever.
our Lord Jesus Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me then he took the cup gave thanks gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me and the peace of the Lord be with you always And receive the riches of salvation through this special banquet.
please stand. We continue on the bottom of page 15 of the service folder as we join in thanksgiving. Hear the prayer of your people, O Lord, that the lips which have praised you here may glorify you in the world, that the eyes which have seen the coming of your Son may long for his coming again, and that all who have received in his true body and blood the pledge of your forgiveness may be restored to live a new and holy life through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you his peace. <laughs>